Hi, welcome to the NBAC Lab. I'm NBAC research intern Cindy Kotrick. Here at the lab, we house thousands of artifacts collected from the field and carefully study these objects made and modified by people. But archaeologists are also interested in the non-portable remains of human activity, what we call features. We've mentioned features in other MVAC videos, including those on flotation, both the long and short versions, the Sand Lake Archaeological District, and profiles. Sometimes features are identified by a cluster of artifacts, and other times by traces of a pit dug into the ground that has darkened compared to the natural surrounding soil as organic matter within the pit has decayed. This sketch map of a deep pit feature shows all the different types of soil marked as different colors. Features might be intentionally placed, like a trench for a palisade, or more informal, like a scatter of refuse. Whatever the case, the context, where everything is found and how the materials recovered relate to one another, provides important information about what happened, when, and why. Today, we're going to take a closer look at what some kinds of features in the La Crosse area and the wider Upper Mississippi Valley look like, in terms of both general shape and types more narrowly defined by function. We'll also see a bit about what they tell us about how people lived. Many of these examples are from the late pre-contact Oneota tradition, which we commonly see around the La Crosse region. But keep in mind that similar and different features are found in other time periods and other geographic areas. See the timestamps in the description box to jump to a specific section and learn about a particular feature type. Archaeologists identify features in the field by digging excavation units, stripping the topsoil from large areas with heavy machinery, and observing cut or eroded landforms. In the case of controlled hand excavation or mechanical removal of the topsoil, features are often first observed from the top in plan view. In this example from Onalaska, Wisconsin, dark feature stains are visible against lighter sandy soil following the removal of the topsoil. We record the locations and dimensions of possible features and describe the characteristics of the soil and the artifacts encountered before and during excavation, both on the small scale of each feature, with this example from feature 88 with two different views of the plan, and at the site level to interpret the features individually and as they relate to one another. Sometimes natural remains, like decaying tree root, look dark like features from the stripped surface. But on excavation, they're revealed to not be directly related to human activity. They might not have artifacts or other signs that humans were involved with them at all. Let's cover some general forms or shapes archaeologists might use to describe features before moving into some more specific functions. Sometimes a feature might be a simple lens shape of soil that differs from the natural soil around it. Or it could be a cluster of artifacts, either because that's what's deposited or because that's all that's left after plowing, erosion, or other activity over time. This lens appeared within areas of darker soil that served as agricultural ridges at a site near on Alaska. Features like this can contain charcoal, charred plant remains, animal remains, ash, scatters of artifacts like waste flakes and other debris from flint napping, what's called debitage, and pottery sherds. Some pits are deeper and can be basin shaped or straight sided. They might gradually slope to the base like the feature on the left in plan view on the top and later in profile at the bottom. And some features might have more vertical walls and a flatter bottom, like the feature on the right. This complex feature also appears in the MVAC video Vertical View, 
archaeology and profile. See that video for more information on how archaeologists describe and record features. Features like these could have originally been lined with grasses, sometimes capped with clay, and used for storage of plant resources like corn, beans, and squash. Or they might have been used for garbage, broken or dull stone and bone tools, debitage, pottery sherds, and animal bone and plant remains left over from processing or making foods. Storage pits often were reused as refuse pits, a good reminder that the function of a feature might have changed over time, and the artifacts and layers deposited help us to figure out its life cycle. Now I've started to mention general feature functions like storage and refuse disposal. As archeologists go from describing a feature to considering its form, soil contents, artifacts, and floral and faunal remains, and how all these relate to each other, they begin to interpret possible functions and activities that resulted in the feature's creation. They can also learn more about the season or seasons represented and what the remains reveal about the local environment and where people obtained resources. Let's take a closer look at some of the interpreted feature types found around the Upper Mississippi Valley. One special kind of feature mainly used, at least initially, for storage is the bell-shaped pit. Bell-shaped pits have a narrow top that constricts and then expands to a wider bottom as seen in this feature from an Oneota site in Onalaska. This feature was dug into a secondary agricultural ridge and sits atop an older primary ridge. We will delve further into agricultural ridges like these shortly. This example from Buffalo Bird Woman of the Hidatsa shows how bell-shaped pits could have been used for the storage of plant resources like corn, beans, squash, and sunflower. Ridged field agriculture was an important part of subsistence for indigenous people living here in the past. At certain sites in the La Crosse area, indigenous people constructed ridges of soil to grow corn, beans, and squash, and rebuilt them over time. Archaeologists can see them in plan as they dig through the soil with depth, as on the left, but they appear even more starkly in profile as on the right. This provides an excellent snapshot of how the ridges changed over time. Light-colored, smile-shaped areas show where sediment accumulated in the ridges and people built over the deposits. Excavation over wide areas such as large blocks, can reveal patterns in the horizontal layout of the ridges and how these relate to use of the landscape and possible family farming plots. See Dr. Connie Arzigian's video on indigenous ridged field agriculture at the Sand Lake Archaeological District for more information. Hearths and earth ovens are locations often lined with stones where people built fires for cooking and other activities needing heat. An earth oven can be seen here on the left and a shallower hearth on the right. Archaeologists might find remains like fire altered rock, charcoal that can sometimes be identified to genus or species, burned earth and ash. Charred plants and animal remains left behind provide clues as to what people were cooking and how they prepared plant and animal resources. Middens are areas where people disposed of refuse, often in thin layers over time, and they can take on a lens-like appearance. This example from Mill Pond in Crawford County is a shell midden with that disposed of shell clearly visible in the excavation walls.
House floors and basins, like this series of photos from an Oneota site show, might be recognized by soil stains or soil compacted from people walking, sitting, sleeping, and taking part in other activities there. They provide insight into housing style through their shape and size. For example, Oneota longhouses that could fit multiple nuclear families. Features such as hearths might appear within the house itself, and along with the artifacts found, shed light on the activities that took place and how space within the house was organized. If multiple houses are found at a site, their relationship to one another and to other activity areas can reveal information about how people laid out their community. A post mold or post hole, like this example, is a spot where a wood post for a structure decomposed or where a hole for a post was dug, darkening the soil. If the wood for the post has been charred and preserved, a floral specialist might be able to identify it to its genus or species, providing insight into the type of wood used. Groups of post molds or post holes can reveal patterns that define the outlines of structures such as houses, as in this graphic, or platforms, as well as fences and stockades, like this trench of post holds for a stockade at a site not too far east of La Crosse. Caches are collections of stored materials, like bone or partially worked lithics saved to later make into more formal tools. Examples include bison scapulate, which could be fashioned into hose for gardening, deer mandibles or lower jaws used for plant processing, and monos, grinding stones held in the hand and often used with larger stones called metades underneath as a base. Archaeologists, of course, also find features at historic sites where Euro-American, American, as well as Native American people lived. Archaeologists might uncover features at former sites of military forts, like Second Fort Crawford in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, trading posts, shops, cabins, and farmsteads. Features include privies, where people disposed of refuse, wells, cisterns and other brick-lined structures, cellars, and other structural remains, like foundations for buildings, floors, and trenches. Archaeologists commonly find artifacts such as glass bottles, different kinds of ceramics like whiteware and stoneware, personal items such as buttons, metal objects, and construction or structural material like nails, bricks, and mortar. These features and artifacts can provide information on dating, building materials, and the organization of space within structures and across sites. This in turn ties into explorations of class, culture, and change over time. Late historic or modern features such as plow scars and trenches for utilities can disturb older features. Plow scars like these from a plow cutting through the topsoil down into the subsoil, might contain artifacts moved from their original position. We can study disturbed artifacts and features, as well as the causes of the disturbance, to better understand what happened and how people used the land from the earliest activity up to the present. Features of all kinds tell us about a wide variety of human activities and modifications of the landscape. From artifact scatters strewn at single points in time to more prolonged, repeated, and intense events. The examples shown here give you an idea of how archaeologists working in the upper Mississippi Valley identify, describe, and ultimately interpret features, and when pertinent, group them into different types to study the past. For more information, see the description box. And to further explore archaeological topics, 
find links to MVAC's social media, and to view and subscribe to our monthly e-news, check out MVAC's website. Thanks for watching.